Since 2016, Canvas Curse speedruns have seen a great deal of optimization. Runners, including myself, are pushing the game to its limit. Due to some discoveries I made in summer of 2016, the tool-assisted scene saw an even more drastic increase in optimization than real-time speedruns. Now, however, the discoveries that made the optimization possible for tasks are creeping their way into RTA, and they've already been proven feasible to execute. This is due to the Wii U Virtual Console release making input buffering between consecutive frames possible. I thought it would be beneficial to make a full explanation video of the discoveries for clarity and documentation purposes, as well as to help out any future runners or task contributors. To begin explaining how the discoveries work, I need to start from the absolute basics. Drawing a line is simple, right? You drag the stylus across the screen. The way the game interprets this action is less obvious than that. A line is composed of linked line segments, each beginning where the last ended, besides the first. To draw a line, first you start with a touch input. You input out a location and can hold it as long as you want. When you move the stylus a sufficient distance away, a segment is formed. You can hold your input so long as you have ink. The game is pulling for continuations of the line every successive frame, or for a new line to start. You repeat the movement of your stylus to chain segments together and end the process by either running out of ink or releasing the stylus for a frame. To draw the initial line segment you don't need ink, but obviously to draw a whole line you need a non-negligible amount. This line segment shown is of minimal length. A segment can be of any length between 6 and 47 pixels. Here's an example of a maximal line segment. These numbers are based on empirical evidence, but apply to almost all situations you'll ever see. Individual segments only have collision for a single frame, and disappear a frame later. Their main purpose is to dissolve a line, or for the traditional purpose, joining together. You know, a full line. Of the criteria for a line to persist, the most important is having at least two adjoining segments. Being able to draw segments of different lengths between consecutive frames is very important, as you'll see. As a side note, it is occasionally useful to maximize a line's total length, regardless of ink reserves. A neat trick to do this is to use up all but the last drop, and then maximize the very last segment. This works because as long as you have ink, any ink, you can draw out a segment of any length. I call this the last drop effect. Outside of the mechanics of line composition is how Kirby actually interacts with a line. Because of ink concerns or direction changing, you may find yourself needing to swap between lines on the fly. Kirby can be attached to only one line at a time, or more specifically, one line segment. Collisions between competing lines either result in full detachment or rebound, or some preference decision. Notice how lines light up differently over time as Kirby alternates attachment. The idea of line preference is useful to hold on to. Take this scene for instance. What do you expect to happen here? Which line should Kirby be attached to after this collision? Let's see. Hold on, what just happened? Kirby just teleported backwards. But why? Let's keep going. It happened again. This is a phenomenon known as position correction, and it is the single most broken mechanic in the game. Do you believe me? How about now? Let's break down what's happening. A lot just happened. First, I'm sure you're all wondering what happened at the end of the launch I showed off, where Kirby seemed to die very suddenly off screen. To put it succinctly, Kirby got launched out of bounds, fell prey to out of bounds mechanics, and rode up the wall to instant death. Here's a simple recreation of what happened. The reason Kirby died is because the absolute bounds of the level are dictated by the limits of where the camera can go. If Kirby exits through the top here, a crush state is detected, being between two perceived walls, which translates to an insta-kill. Now to explain position correction itself. When Kirby comes to a head with competing line segments, it's not immediately clear which line Kirby should be attached to. So as a failsafe mechanism, the game places you at the start of the last line segment of the line you are on. Until the problem is resolved, you can find yourself repeating this position correction over and over. Now as a fortunate side effect, if your position is corrected as the line fizzles out behind you, and the spot you are corrected to has already fizzled out, you are now untethered and the rapid change in position is interpreted as speed based on how much you were displaced in that single frame. It's important to note that you aren't building up speed, you are getting it instantaneously based on rapid change in position. It's also important to note that this collision is very precise. While there are multiple locations on the segment at which this trick will work, they are all pixel perfect, parallel to and one pixel above the line segment. 
This makes it very difficult outside of task setting. Remember how I said being able to draw segments of different lengths was very important? The magnitude of the position correction launch is bounded by the length of the last segment you are writing. So if you maximize the length of the last segment, you maximize the speed from the launch. And because you can get a launch from most pixels parallel to the line, you actually get a range of speeds to choose from, depending on where you put the intersection. This gives you absolute control over your speed and trajectory. Very cool. Now that we all understand how launching works, I can begin to explain the implications of launching. First, there are a lot of ways your launch attempts can fail without apparent reason. They're mostly all avoidable, but can lead to a deal of frustration, and they all have to do with the way the game determines line attachment or in its collision detection. The collision detection system is not about prediction, it's about detection on each individual frame. So if on no individual frame you are colliding with anything, you can either pass right through or lodge yourself in an object. The natural consequence of lodging yourself in an object is getting forced out of it. The game is very adamant that you do not stay inside something, so you are either forced out the way you came if your clip is too shallow, or if you are detected very far into an object, you will be ejected violently upward. The mechanics of where you can exist in an obstacle are quite interesting. Lines are useful to manipulate your position. The only way you can control your position within an obstacle is with lines. If you become untethered, you can sometimes go so fast that you are off camera, and because you can't draw anything off screen, you will keep riding the obstacle upward to a landing or certain depth. You can manipulate your horizontal movement with angled lines. Kirby moves in the direction of a positive slope, but does not rise vertically if placed right. Moving vertically upward is easy with lines tethering you, and out of bounds mechanics forcing you upward. Going downward is a task. To do so you need a camera lock wall, and if you have momentum in the direction of that wall you can use lines at the base of your model to suck you downward. The reason your vertical height appears to be constant when moving horizontally is because there are a finite number of notches, for lack of a better word, that you can exist in. They are somewhere between 30 and 40 vertical units apart, and are what I expect to be the vertical boundaries of tiles within the game. Horizontal movement is free, but you can only exist at vertical positions in these discrete units, which is why the movement looks like that. Tool assisted runs care deeply about ink conservation, because refreshing reserves takes time on the ground, and if you can make it through a loading zone before running out, you get a free refresh on the next screen. Line efficiency ensures on most screens of the game you can get where you need to go with minimal refreshes. Sometimes you are constrained for space, so you need more efficient use of your space to actually get a clip. You can transfer momentum between lines to make clever use of the space you have. Sometimes, though, you have to do even better because there's no aerial space for you to launch through. This leads into the next concept, a more direct method of clipping. Sometimes you seem to have all the room in the world for aerial movement, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the goal is only a short distance away, but small confines prevent your attempts at getting where you want. A more direct way of clipping than absurd speed is position correction clipping, in which the line segment you use to correct your position actually originates inside the wall. This way, when you force your position to be corrected, you go to the origin of the line segment, which is out of bounds, and from there you can go wherever you want. Direct clipping is often useful for instances in which you need to ride a wall for a long vertical passage. Kirby actually continues to roll in the direction you're facing when in a wall, so if you're riding a thin wall upward, Kirby could actually roll at the wall, bonk, turn around, and fall in bounds in the direction you started. If you clip directly, as compared to launching, you minimize initial horizontal speed, so you can ensure you get all the way up to your destination. Water also causes a problem for open air movement. When you breach the surface of water, the collision detection mechanism detects a collision and causes a rebound similar to a wall. This means water between you and where you want to go will prevent an easy clip. But with direct clipping, you avoid being exposed to water during the position correction and can go directly out of bounds. When moving through the air, many things hinder your movement. While breakneck speed is great, you are not impervious. Enemies can still stop you, with interesting consequences. Even if the camera has fully caught up to you and you are somehow able to tap an enemy before you reach it, the state change of passing through an enemy kills your momentum. The same concept applies if you tap yourself in preparation for some impact, or need to slow down or change direction suddenly. Sometimes you are able to tap yourself in the early phase of a launch to add a horizontal component to an otherwise vertical launch, but the window in which it doesn't kill your momentum is fuzzy. This is a situational technique anyways. Ceilings are hard to break into because not only do you have to break the surface boundary, you need to go between inbounds and the first notch in one frame. This is difficult because if you are too close to the wall, you collide with it, but spacing yourself away from the wall so you can clip requires even more speed for you to get lodged in it. As a consequence, it is traditionally impossible to clip into a ceiling, except in the rare case. Two counterexamples. 
If what you're clipping into is thin enough that it has no notches, you can pass right through with brute force. The other counter example is the odd sloped ceiling, which behaviorally acts as a normal vertical wall would if you get the perfect diagonal launch. It is incredibly precise. The applications of these techniques are still being explored, and future task work leading to a potential 100% task is required. Things we do know is that you can collect metals very easily. Many, many sequence breaks are possible, and the collection itself doesn't kill momentum. We can sequence break the barriers guarding many metals, for instance. This even works with other characters. The future for Canvas Curse speedruns are bright. Stay tuned for more amazing revelations and record-breaking action.